we were talking about uh, the stress field around the well bore and around a well bore and primarily what we care about is the stress at the well bore because that's we're going to evaluate the failure model to determine if the well bore is going to have breakouts or tensile fractures and then the appearance of those or the degree to which breakouts are occurring will give us some idea about the stability of the well bore. And we'll talk about that, what we mean by stability. I've, I've used the word loosely uh, up to now. Today we'll, we'll give it a more firm definition on what we, talk, what we mean when we talk about um, stable well bores. There are, aside from just the far field stresses, there are other things that can affect the stress field near the well bore. And uh, one of those is thermal effects, right? Because we're drilling and we use the drilling mud to remove the cuttings, right? To bring the cuttings to the surface. And that drilling mud is almost always cooler than the formation at the bit. Uh, certainly in a, in a geothermal well, it's, it's much, much cooler, right? But, but almost even in petroleum reservoirs, it's, it's typically at the bit, the drilling fluid will be cooler than the formation, and that cooling effect uh, has effect principally on the hoop stress. Okay, the, I don't know if I gave it that name last time, but the sigma theta theta, right? That's the hoop stress. Okay, so if you hear me talking about hoop stress in the future, we're talking about sigma theta theta. So sigma theta theta is the hoop stress. So the, uh, thermal, the thermal effect is a strongly time-dependent thing because when we talk about temperature, temperature conducts via diffusive processes, right? And I put down the, the heat equation there, right? So anyone that's taken reservoir simulation, this equation should look familiar to you, right? We, solved that, we actually solved that equation in, re in, res in res 3, right? Reservoir engineering 3. So many of you had me for that, so I know you've seen it before. We simply replaced the T's with a P, and we called it the pressure diffusivity equation. <coughs> but that's the same equation that governs heat conduction, where the alpha T is a coefficient of thermal expansion. Or, or it's a, it's a, uh, not, not thermal expansion. It's a coefficient of, uh, of heat conduction. And, uh, and when we're talking about <coughs> rocks, uh, the amount of silica in the rock really matters uh, because quartz is like an order of magnitude more heat conductive than almost any other mineral. Right? So if you have a highly silica rock, then it sort of speeds up the, the process of conduction and uh, can, can make it more relevant to the problem. Um, we're not going to solve this equation uh, in this class. And of course, uh, if you remember when we talked about uh, when we were talking about effective stress, we had um, this effective stress due to thermal pore elasticity, which would be your normal sort of um, uh, your normal uh, stress strain relation. minus the pore pressure, uh, and then there was a term had to do with thermal conductivity, which in this case what had a, we also used alpha there, it's, it's, it's not the same alpha, but it's the coefficient of thermal expansion uh, times the volumetric uh, strain times I, right? <coughs> uh, times, the bulk, times the bulk modulus. So you have this ad additional induced stress due to uh, the thermal expansion. So anyway, w when we solve these equations called thermoporoelasticity, right? So now we're talking about our normal mechanics, conservational momentum, plus pore pressure diffusion, plus temperature diffusion. Uh, they get fairly complicated, but when you solve the thermal mechanical equations, and you can do it in closed form, uh, you know, with some approximations for 
uh, the circular geometry around wellbore, what you result is like this integral equation. And uh, we, can, we can do like a series of uh, approximation of that. And there's a couple of terms. Those equations are in Zoback's book. We're not going to do it here. Uh, but in the end, under steady state conditions, then you get this uh, delta t, I mean, uh, this delta, delta hoop stress, right? So this is the, the increment of hoop stress associated with an increment of temperature change, OK? Uh, you know, everybody knows what I mean by steady state. So we're talking about in long time, uh, ignoring the effects of the time dependence, right? So in, in a long time, steady state conditions, we have this increment of hoop stress, right? <clears throat> and again, because the delta T is usually a cooling, right? It's usually cooler, then this induces actually more tensile stress, more tensile hoop stress, right? Or another way you can think of that is if you have a highly compressive hoop stress because you have a high mud weight or you're drilling over balanced, then the, the fact that the the, the fact that the, temp the the temperature effect can actually then reduce that over balance, bring it sort of back into a balanced scenario. So. If we look at the problem, and, it, and this is the same conditions, the, that these are, uh, it's it's this same problem, right? Except now, so that's from the homework from last lecture and from the homework. But now we look at a delta T of 25 degrees C, uh, and in this case, we're drilling over balance a little bit, okay? So six megapascal difference, then. What you see over here is uh, the sigma theta. Oops. This is sigma theta theta at the azimuth of SH max, okay, uh, versus normalized distance. And so this is time. So these these increments. Uh, so th this line is at one second, and then at a hundred seconds and a thousand se uh, seconds. Uh, not not seconds, minutes probably. I can't remember what the time increment is. But it's either minutes or hours, but that's probably I think it's minutes. So at one minute, a hundred minutes, a thousand minutes. This is this is from the well bore. Uh, so this is these are sort of the steady state approximations because between a hundred and a thousand, there's really no change. Then you get this kind of effect, and you can see that at the well bore, which is here. The effect is pretty small, and in the in the sigma RR case, remember sigma RR evaluated at the well bore is just delta P, right? And so, uh, if if you're drilling perfectly balanced, if delta P is zero, then the the change in temperature has no effect at the at the well bore. Okay. So then. You might ask the question, since uh, and this brings this this is the same idea, can can we in, get some stability from cooling, right? So the fact that I can either heat up or cool the drilling fluid, could I use that to stabilize a wellbore, right? And so what I mean by stabilize a wellbore, if I had a wellbore that was experiencing breakouts, could I use could I then say heat up or cool down. In most cases, it would be heat up. But could I use some temperature change in the drilling fluid to change the hoop stress in a way uh, that I could uh, reduce the, the amount of breakout? So this is that plot last time where I've sketched the breakout width, or not me, but the, the figure from Zoback's book, this, where the, the, the breakout width, so this is for a given value of unconfined compressive strength using a more Coulomb failure model, unconfined compressive strength and, and um, internal friction angle, 
you predict the breakouts to be this, this high, so if I can cool the drilling fluid in such a way, then I would produce smaller breakouts and therefore add some stability. So, I mean, these are real figures using real information, I think. So this is like uh, cooling it by 25 degrees or something like that. Well, so the answer is yes, in theory you can, but the thing is, it's just not practical because an increment, a small increment of temperature change has a much smaller effect than a small increment of change in the mud weight. And it's much easier to just change the mud weight a little bit than it is to heat up or cool down the drilling fluid and maintain that throughout the entire well bore. Um, it, it, you know, the amount of energy required to do that is, is, is just not, not practical when it's quite easy to just change the mud weight a small amount. And that small change in the mud weight will have a bigger effect. So uh, long-winded way to say that sometimes this is important. Uh, it's certainly an uh, important consideration when designing uh, geothermal reservoirs for sure. But for the most part, you know, as a mechanism for designing or adding stability to the wellbore, you know, thermal effects are not the way to, to go about doing that.